Welcome to Moments with Marilyn. I'm your host, Marilyn Boyer, the mom of 14 homeschool kids who love the Lord and love each other. I absolutely love young moms, and it's my passion to encourage you and share tips and tools to make your journey easier. Today, we have an exciting podcast. We're going to talk about an aspect of our ministry that you may not have heard about, the Uncle Rick Audio Club. This is the second part of our podcast about the Uncle Rick Audio Club. And gather your kids if you haven't, because they'll want to hear the fun stories so that you can get kind of a taste of what the Uncle Rick Audio Club is like. So, Uncle Rick, tell us a story, please. Okay. What period of history would you like a story from? Let's hear one first about the War of Independence, American okay. Revolution. War of Independence. Okay, great. There's some great stories coming out of that. However, there's a reason that I record my audio books down at the little house in the pasture on the farm. I do my best storytelling on the farm. So, in order to recreate that as best possible, put on my farming hat. Ah, now I feel better. Hey little buddies, it's Uncle Rick coming to you not from the little house in the past year. We can hear the birds sing, the cows move, the horses neigh, and Uncle Rick talk to his little buddies, but from Mrs. Boyer's dining room. This will be good enough. Let's talk about the War of Independence. Oh, boy. One of the most exciting stories I know of from that war is of Mrs. Nancy Hart, a pioneer mama in the colony of Georgia. You know, Georgia fell to the British pretty early in the Revolutionary War. With the fall of the city of Savannah, most of the population was under the British thumb. And so the colonists were driven back. Uh, into the woods. They had to hide and fight as best they could. Meanwhile, their neighbors, the Tories, a Tory was an American who was still loyal to the king. The Tories were robbing and murdering and burning the homes of the patriots. But pioneer mamas were tough people. All the pioneers had to be tougher. They didn't survive down in those hills and swamps. Mrs. Nancy Hart was one such woman. Her husband was a member of the Patriot Militia in Georgia. But he wasn't the only person that could defend a log cabin full of six kids. Oh, no. Mrs. Nancy was perfectly capable. In fact, she had been involved in some Indian battles in earlier times. The Indians called her the War Woman. How would you like that for a nickname? That's what they called her. Ms. Nancy wasn't beautiful, but she was tough. She stood six feet tall, which made her just about the same height as General Washington in a day when most men weren't nearly that tall. And she could hold her own. One day, she was boiling soap. You know how they used to make soap in those big black cauldrons over a fire? Well, she had soap, lye soap, stirring in a big pot over a fireplace. And here she is in her old bonnet and dress, Stirring that soap, bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. No, wait, wrong book, wrong story. Okay, I think that's Hamlet. Anyway, so she's stirring the stuff in the pot, and one of her children sidles over and whispers, Mama, Mama, somebody's peeking in. Nancy never even turned her head, but she said, We've got a Tory spying on us. She kept right on stirring that soap over that fireplace with a big ladle, but she glanced at the corner of her eye. And sure enough, in a crack between the logs of her cabin, she saw a piece of a face. It was one of the Tories spying on her and her family. Why? Hoping that perhaps her husband was home and he could be captured or killed. She never said a word, never gave any indication she knew he was there. She just kept stirring. And then she reached in with a big ladle to test the texture of the soap. And then in a second, she had filled that dip her up with that boiling lye and whirl and splattered it right against the wall. And you heard a scream that would curdle your blood from outside. She had got that evil Tory spy right in the eyes with that hot stuff. She went out and took him prisoner. And when her husband came home, turned him over to him and he turned him over to the militia. Well, that's an exciting story. There's lots about Nancy. They say that she actually had a stump out in the front yard of her cabin facing the creek. This is where any travelers would cross, a shallow place. And that tree stump, she had sawed a V-shaped notch in so she could put her musket in it and aim that much more surely at any Tory or Redcoat who dared to cross her creek. Well, one day, Redcoat, not Redcoat, one day, 
five Tories visited Mrs. Nancy's cabin. They wanted to capture her husband, but he was in hiding. He was back in the woods with the livestock because they had heard that there were Tories in the neighborhood looking to make trouble. And so her husband had driven the livestock back in the woods so the Tories couldn't steal them and had stayed away himself so he couldn't be captured. These men came up to the door of the cabin, way too many for her to fight alone, so she couldn't do anything except let them in. They came in and they said, where's your husband? She said, he's hiding. He'll be back to kill some of you very soon. And they said, oh, ho, ho, very brave talk, woman. You're going to fix us dinner. She says, well, you guys have stolen so much of my livestock, I don't have anything to cook but that old stringy tom turkey out there in the yard. They said, he'll do fine. So one of them went out, killed the turkey, and brought it in. Well, Miss Nancy, she's busy over the fireplace. She's got a turkey to dress and cook. She makes some cornbread and so forth. And trip by trip, she's moving back and forth from the fireplace to the table. And one of the men says, don't you have anything to drink here, woman? And she says, just a minute. She goes down to the family cellar underneath the cabin. And there's some homemade moonshine down there. She brings up a pitcher of that and serves it to the gentlemen. And they promptly get raving drunk. Well, you know... The Bible says that wine is deceitful, strong drink is raging, and he who is deceived thereby is not wise. These guys were deceived, and they weren't wise. They all leaned their muskets against the cabin wall and sat down to enjoy getting plastered. But they got a surprise. In one of Ms. Nancy's trips from the fireplace to the table, she put down the food on the table and turned around and snatched one of those muskets. She turned it on the men and said, don't move or you're dead. One of them tried to leap for her. Boom! The cabin was filled with smoke. The noise was deafening. And that Tory fell dead on the floor. Instantly, Nancy snatched another weapon from the wall and pointed at the other man. And she looked right at one of them and said, if anybody moves, I'm going to shoot you. They all sat back down. And she held these four guys there along with this dead body until her husband returned. He went and fetched some more militia members and they took the Tories captive. And one of them said, we'll take these fellows and lock them up, Miss Nancy. They won't bother you anymore. And she says, no, don't you lock them up. They're spies. They're supposed to be hung. You take them out and hang them. And that's what they did. That is, if the story's true, it was handed down through many generations of the family. And it got embellished, no doubt. And it got changed, no doubt. And it got made more colorful in some ways, no doubt. And everybody wondered, was it really true? Was Aunt Nancy really that tough? This would have been around mm, 1778, probably, right in the middle of the war. In 1913, they found out whether it was true or not. Because at that time, they were grading a new railroad bed through that part of Georgia. And in the process, they uncovered five graves. Nothing left but skeletons. But when they were examined, they found that one of the skeletons had a broken rib, as if that man had been shot. The other four all had broken necks, as if they had been hung. Looks like Aunt Nancy was just what they thought she was. But there's still one question. If there were four men against one lone pioneer mama, and if she only had one shot in that musket, and she was looking at one of those men threatening to shoot him, why didn't the other three try to get her? I mean, surely they knew that they could be hung as spies if they, were, if they stayed and were captured by the militia. So other than the one guy that she was threatening, why didn't the other three try it? Well, the fact is that none of them knew who she was talking to because something I hadn't mentioned about Aunt Nancy, she was cross-eyed. Now, if you'd like to hear some more exciting stories about women in the Revolutionary War, there's a bunch. There's the one lady who hid messages for General Washington in the coat buttons of her little boy. They sewed on the button 
underneath the cloth cover, and he could get through the British lines to General Washington's camp where an adult couldn't have done it. And then there's Lydia Dara, the Quaker woman, who carried a message to General Washington through the night on her horse, a female Paul Revere. Oh, that's an exciting story. Love that. Hmm? Love that. Yeah, it's a great story, Lydia Dara. These all come from my storytelling collection. Most of my uh, recordings are audiobooks, but this is a storytelling collection. It's called Petticoat Warriors, and it's true stories of heroines of the War of Independence. Okay, how about one more? How about a story from World War II? Oh, World War II. You know, it was a huge war, uh, millions of lives affected, and millions of great stories. One of my favorites comes from um, our book, and the name of it is? Jake DeShazer. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We got in two books. We've got two. Woo-hoo-hoo, yeah. So we've got it in the biography of Jake DeShazer and... And we have it in Portraits of Integrity. Her book, Portraits of Integrity, written by Marilyn Boyer and her friend Grace Tumas. That is a fantastic book, by the way. My compliments. But let's talk about the biography of Jake DeShazer. Jake DeShazer was an American soldier. He was already in the Army in uh, 1941. And he was on KP duty in Alaska one night. He's peeling potatoes, these giant mountains of potatoes. He's peeling to feed hundreds of men. Everybody had to take their turn. As he's peeling one night, he's listening to the radio when all of a sudden our current program was interrupted by a special announcement. It was the announcement of the attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese the morning of December 7th, 1941. Jake, working away with his knife on his potato, hears this and he stands up and he's enraged. Those rotten Japanese, they attacked our fleet without warning, with no declaration of war. What a dirty, rotten thing to do. And in fact, Nearly 3,000 Americans died in that attack, and much of our Pacific fleet was sunk. Jake was so enraged, he stood up, he took the potato he was holding, and he flung it against the opposite wall, and it smashed in a million pieces. This is the invention of creamed potatoes. He volunteered for a special mission. Word came around, any soldier who wants to volunteer for a crack at Japan can do so. Well, he didn't know what the mission involved and he didn't care. He was so full of bitterness and hatred inside, he just wanted a chance to get revenge on the Japanese. What he found out pretty soon was that he was volunteering for the famous historical flight of Jimmy Doolittle's Raiders. The purpose of this mission was to show both Japan and America that America could strike back and so just a very few months after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Jimmy Doolittle and his men dropped bombs on several cities in Japan to hit back. Well, they had a big problem because Japan was controlling the Pacific for hundreds and hundreds of miles out from the home islands of Japan. And so they couldn't just take off and fly from a ship 50 miles away and drop their bombs. They had to take off from aircraft carriers hundreds of miles away from Japan. And the problem came up that they didn't have enough fuel. They couldn't get from the aircraft carrier over Japan and then come back to the, to the carrier. Just wasn't enough tank room. And so the plan was to drop their bombs on their appointed cities, fly on across the China Sea, and land in the nation of China. Now, over there, there's another problem to deal with. Part of China was already controlled by the Japanese. They did terrible things to China during that war. And so if the Americans ran out of fuel before they could reach friendly China, they were going to land in occupied China and possibly be captured or killed by the Japanese. But these men all volunteered anyway. They knew what the risks were, but they said, we've got to have our shot. And so they did. One morning, they took off from a big aircraft carrier and headed for Japan. 
Now, the plane that Jake was on was headed for a specific city. It was called Nagoya. Remember that name, Nagoya? You're going to hear it again. I may even be on the exam. Off they went. They managed to get through the anti-aircraft fire and dropped their bombs on Nagoya. And then they took off across the China Sea. Again, they evaded the anti-aircraft fire. They made it off the islands of Japan. And somewhere over China, they ran out of fuel and they had to parachute. The next morning, Jake and his crew were all captured by the Japanese. Jake spent the rest of the war, and it was over three and a half years, in Japanese prison camps. He was tortured. He was starved. He lived in a hut through the heat of the summer and the cold of the winter. And every day his hatred for the Japanese grew. He wallowed in despair, in loneliness, in pain, and in bitterness. And then, one day some boxes of books, books written in English, came into the prison compound. One of those books was a Bible. Jake took that Bible he never paid much attention to the scriptures before, but he had watched one of his fellow prisoners die. It was a young lieutenant, and Jake helped to take care of him in his last days. And he asked the lieutenant, he says, aren't you afraid to die? He says, no, I'm not. And he says, you know, you've never acted like you hated the Japs. Why is that? And this lieutenant explained to young Jake from the scriptures how all men are sinners, and how Jesus died for our sins. And because he forgave us, we must forgive others. Jake said, I just can't accept that. He says, these people have been so evil to us. I can't accept that. But he got interested in the Bible. He only had that Bible for three weeks. But during that time, God did a work in Jake DeShazer's heart, and he saved that young man. Soon the war ended and Jake and his starving comrades were set free. He went home to Oregon. He went to Bible college. He became a missionary. Would you care to guess what country he went to? You're right, Japan. Would you care to know what city he started in? The city of Nagoya. Told you you'd hear that one again. And Jake wrote gospel tracts. And he preached and he saw people come to Christ in the turbulent after war years. One day, Jake received a visit. It was the 50th day of a 50 day fast. Jake DeShazer, the man who had hated the Japanese, had spent 50 days in prayer and fasting for the salvation of the nation of Japan. On the 50th day, a knock came on his door. A Japanese man stood there. He said, are you Jake DeShazer? He said, yes, I am. The man came in and they chatted and he said, I'm a Christian now. I got saved reading one of the gospel tracts you wrote. I wanted to meet you. Turns out he was a war veteran too. Turns out he had been involved in the raid on Pearl Harbor. As a matter of fact, his name was Mitsuo Fushida, and he had been the leader of the Pearl Harbor attack. Jake embraced the man. There was no more hate in his heart, only love and sympathy. And these two men became close friends, and they ministered together, preaching the gospel in Japan. But the story doesn't even end there, because Jake was able to receive the grace of God and minister to the people of Japan. Mitsuo Fushida, his new Christian buddy, was invited by Billy Graham to give his testimony at his rallies across the United States. And so this man who had led the first attack on America for the Japanese ministered to hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Americans after he became a Christian. And none of it would happen had God not acted with his grace upon the heart of a hate-filled young soldier named Jake the Shazer. So now we've told you a little bit about the great audio books, including scripture, that uh, I record as Uncle Rick. And 
your kids are going to love them. I know because I love them and thousands of kids all over the country love them, including my kids and grandkids. So let me tell you a little bit about the club and a special offer we're making to you just for the month of November this year. Um, we are going to give you a bundle of goodies as a special inducement to join the club. Remember, you don't have to join for any period of time. You can quit anytime you want, but we want you to try it out because if you don't, you are missing a resource that's going to make your life so much easier. When you don't have time to read to Junior, Uncle Rick does. And I think it'll be a great blessing to your family. But don't take my word for it. Here's what one of our club members says. Thank you so much for making the audio book club. I can't express how excited I am that you've done this. I've been keeping a wish list of audio books I want. You have completely blessed my family by making this book club available and affordable. I cannot wait to share these books with my kids. I know they're going to make a huge difference in their education and their character formation. I'm so grateful that you've done this. Thank you again. With prayers for many blessings for your family, signed Colleen. I don't know who Colleen is, but thank you, Colleen. You're very kind. Now, a special offer for the month of November. We have got a basket of goodies for you that you're not going to believe just for trying the Unc Uncle Rick Audio Book Club. So, Coach, tell us about it. Okay, we have over $120 worth of digital products, a bundle that we are going to give you when you sign up for the Audio Club. There's a series of books that we call the American Adventure Series. They're out of print, but they're excellent books. Um, Cowboys and Cattle Trails, Squanto, John Paul Jones. There's nine of these books, People from History. They're pretty thick books, nine of them. You get all the ebooks, all nine American Adventure ebooks. You get three audios about Thanksgiving. This one is Little Pioneers. This is the book that Uncle Rick actually read from. He's turned it into an audio book. You get, uh, oh, here is Little Pioneers. That's the audio book he's turned it into. Yep. You also get stories of the pilgrims for children and you get stories of the pilgrims. So that's three audiobooks about Thanksgiving, as well as the ebook about Squanto from the American Adventure series. You get that as well. You also get our history book, The Fight for Freedom, which Masterbooks had us write for them. You get all that just for trying out the audio club. So if you join in the month of November, you get over $120 worth. Uncle Rick, thanks for being with us today. That was awesome. I love that story about Jake DeShazer. Yeah, boy. You will find so many stories. It's not just about wars. It's about other things. It's about people's lives, too. Um, the true story of George Washington, Ben Franklin. We can't get into that now. We're running out of time. But too bad. Wow. Um, thank you for joining us today. I hope My you'll join pleasure. us again sometime. Thanks for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. And remember, the special with the $120 worth of free digital products is just for the month of November. So if you've been considering joining the Uncle Rick Club, this is a great time to do it. Don't delay. If you're interested in joining the Uncle Rick Club, you're interested in finding out more information about it, go to our web website, UncleRickAudios.com. You'll find all the information you need there on that website.